Amen. Please be seated. Gabby, come on up. I wanted to do this a week ago, but we had a bit of a hiccup. Uh, the hiccup was Gabby's uh, femur uh, has been determined to be fractured, and uh, she's on crutches. Um, but uh, Gabby has been uh, wanting to go to El Salvador in an internship for an extended period of time, and there's been a bunch of hiccups. And we almost had another hiccup. Uh, but uh, she's talked with them down there, correct, and they've approved her coming even with this last hiccup. So she's headed to El Salvador for three-month internship. And we're excited about sharing that with you this morning. Wanted to do it last week, but we had to give her a little bit of a week to recover here so that she could come and be before you. So I told her I'd give her time in the morning service to share with you whatever she wants to without grilling her in questions. Um, so I'm turning the mic over to Gabby. I'm standing by for moral support. How's that, Gabby? If you need Sounds anything, good. let me know, but go ahead. Sounds good. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so excited for this summer and expectant of what God is going to do. Um, like Pastor Scott said, there's been a lot of hiccups along the way. And I just want to remind everyone that no matter how uncertain the world may be or how, um, I don't know, like, how uncertain it might be, that God is good and that Jesus remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He is worthy of our complete trust and our full surrender. Amen. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Gabby, for sharing this morning. We're looking forward to praying for her. I, you know, stay here for a second, Gabby. I want to pray for you right now. Um, if you'd pray for her, she's going to be down there for three months. Um, they got some exciting things going on in El Salvador. I'm going to share a couple, with, uh, a couple of them with you. Um, and one of them is exciting is that we got uh, another intern going. I think this is the third intern that we've had go to uh, uh, Broken and serve on that uh, site we're partnering with down there. Um, they are going to open, it looks like, a new uh, 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 La Fuente program in the third location. And I was talking with Tony last week, so uh, let's pray for Gabby, and I'll give you some more information in a bit. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity uh, for Gabby to go. Uh, God, I pray you'll continue to meet her finances. Um, and uh, Lord, I pray, Lord, she'd have peace. I pray for uh, her family that they'd have peace as she's gone for three months. Uh, we do pray for healing uh, in her leg. We also pray for mobility while she's down there. And uh, your guidance and wisdom for her related to what she can do and what she can't do. Uh, but Lord, we just commit her to you. We commit the mission there in El Salvador. And we just, uh, Lord, we raise them up and pray that we'll con they'll continue to connect with students down there and share Jesus. Uh, be a blessing in Gabby's life. Uh, physically, God, we just pray for her healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Gab. All right. Uh, one of the other things that's going on down in El Salvador is, uh, uh, as you know, a year or so ago, I, or over a year ago now, I went to Costa Rica and served uh, their team there uh, on a weekend. And uh, they've invited me back to come and serve. This year they won't travel outside of the country because of COVID. Um, but they've uh, asked me to come back and share uh, on their weekend uh, uh, down in El Salvador uh, uh, for a team uh, building weekend uh, later in the year. Uh, so you can pray about that. I mentioned to Popa, uh, where they opened the second La, La Fuente. They're about ready to open a third. Um, and uh, yeah, keep praying for them. Pray for Tony and Laura and the team down there. Uh, just doing fantastic things. Um, interns are arriving. Gabby, this week, right? You leave? Yeah. All right. She's leaving this week to arrive down there for the next three months. So uh, keep her uh, in prayer as well. I don't see them here this morning in the first service, but I wanted to recognize 50 years together, Roger and Karen Johnson, Saturday. They are 50 years together. And uh, if you uh, get a chance, uh, if you see them or connect with them, congratulate them on that milestone of 50 years together in the Lord. All right? We have an interesting passage of Scripture uh, as we get, uh, after we're, uh, we're returning to uh, Paul's letter to the churches that, there in Galatia that he established on his first missionary tour. Uh, the passage is interesting because the subject matter of the text is this, getting the gospel right, which is uh, the title of today's message. The passage is also very, very interesting because the process of getting the gospel right requires Paul 
uh, to enter into conflict. And conflict is not something that most people welcome. Uh, most people don't like to deal with it and or most people don't do conflict well. In fact, we're, I'll be honest with you, very poor at doing conflict well. Uh, most would rather run away from conflict rather than move towards it. In writing this letter to the churches in the Galatia region, Paul is in the process of making sure that the two, true gospel that he preached to them, the gospel that brought them salvation uh, to all of those believers in that region, he's uh, writing to them so that that gospel is preserved in total with nothing subtracted from it or anything added to it. We know from uh, chapter 1 of this letter that Judaizers, most likely Judaizers, uh, who had come potentially from the Jerusalem church, had come to distort the gospel and to undermine Paul's authority and to add requirements to the gospel in order for someone to be saved. They believe that anyone who comes to faith in Christ needs to be circumcised and observe, uh, observe other Jewish law traditions, keeping the feasts and other things like that. They have come to these churches in the Galatia region and are attempting to distort the gospel that Paul preached, taught, and the believers were saved by. By the way, throughout history, throughout history, there have been those who have risen up inside the church and those who have come into the church from outside the church who want to distort the gospel. In our world today, we are not exempt from the same difficulty on a quite regular basis. It's occurring in many places in our world today, especially from inside the church. You can note a number of church splits, denominational splits, I'll put it that way, related to encroaching matters into the church that have allowed to then come in and then divide the denomination or the church. How important is it to get the gospel right? How important is it to preserve the truth of the gospel? In my opinion, it's worth the struggle. It's worth the conflict. It's worth the battle to stand firm. That's what Paul is doing. Let's see as we turn to our text for today uh, how Paul does that. We start in Galatians chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. We read these words. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas taking along Titus with me, and I went up because of a revelation and set before them, and then in parentheses he says, those privately before those who seemed influential, that's who he set before, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. Now, at this point, Paul has been engaged with the ministry of the gospel for close to 17 years. Sometimes we miss how long Paul's been doing the message and been doing ministry. When we read texts like this, we don't, we don't put the timeline together. For close to 17 years, he has been doing ministry if we include his conversion and three-year experience in Arabia, which I talked to you about when we began this book. We know that the Jews, Judaizers who came into the fellowship in Galatia were most likely from Jerusalem. And as mentioned, they have questioned Paul's authority as apostle. They're undermining his authority as the leader of these, chur these churches that he planted on his first tour. They're undermining the leader's authority. <clears throat> So Paul is reestablishing his authority in these churches that he's planted as he writes. He has already told them his call and the gospel did not come from the church leaders in Jerusalem, the other apostles, the converted Jewish believers, Jesus' disciples. He has told them that, that it came to him by personal revelation from Christ and God on his Damascus Road experience and then his three years in Arabia. He is now telling them that he was not called to go to Jerusalem at this late date after doing ministry that long. He is not called to Jerusalem by the other apostles or the church leaders, but went because because of a personal revelation to himself. In other words, God told Paul to go. Like God told Jonah. Paul's going to be obedient. Jonah wasn't. I suggest, just a side note, God tells you to do something, do it. Go read Jonah. Do it. I'm sure you don't want to be in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights. I'm sure when the whale spit Jonah up on the shore, it wasn't pretty. God tells you to do something, go. Paul clarifies this revelation 
to go, but the Judaizers were more likely distorting why he went. Most likely, they have been saying that Paul was called to go to Jerusalem by the other apostles and church leaders to account for his wrong gospel, the gospel that he was preaching, thus giving them perfect opportunity while Paul's gone to press their gospel with Jewish law traditions added to it. That's what's taking place. Paul in his letter is saying he was not called by this leadership but went on his own accord because of the revelation of God. While there, he had a private meeting with a small number of the church leadership. The matter at this point was not for the entire church body. Listen, sometimes folks, church leadership deals with matters without the whole church body involved. It's an okay thing to happen, okay? Sometimes church leadership makes decisions and it's an okay thing to trust church leadership to make those decisions. That's why you put church leadership in place when you voted at the annual meeting. Amen? That should get a, very, a large amen. Amen? Amen. That's why we elect church leadership. Paul is going... Sorry, I missed the spot in my notes. He wanted, to, he wanted to know that the Gentiles, what Paul has gone and put the gospel before them is because he wanted to know that the Gentiles would be received into Christian fellowship when converted, just like the Jewish converts were received into fellowship. Paul is not asking them to approve his gospel. We already read that in chapter 1. He said there's no other gospel than what he's preaching. What he wants to do is he wants to know all of these church plants that I've done and those people who believed I want to know that you're, they're accepted into the fellowship. They're accepted in the kingdom. They're not approving his gospel. He wants to know that just as they've accepted the converted Jews after delivering the gospel of salvation to them, that they would, they would, uh, the same results would happen. And these believers in Galatia, the Gentile believers, would be welcomed into the church as they're welcomed in the kingdom of God. He, again, he is not looking for their approval of his gospel. Just confirmation. That they, the Jerusalem church, and his church plants were engaging in the same ministry with the same results. Let's return to our text this morning. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery again, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved. Paul is standing firm. Paul is meeting with the main apostolic leadership in the Jerusalem church in private. False brethren, brethren have snuck in to the meeting to spy out what has taken place. They want to know if Paul and the influential leadership, that's as Paul referred to them, are going to make sure that cir circumcision and other Jewish traditions will be maintained as part of the gospel, part of the requirements for becoming right with God. Paul uses strong words here. As he refers to such an addition to the gospel as bringing believers back into slavery. Back into a works righteousness which Paul was all too familiar with. Remember who's writing. Paul was all too familiar with. Remember he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. The Hebrew of Hebrews. He was the guy who was keeping all of those traditions day in and day out. Now we find out why Paul brought along Titus to this meeting. Titus is an uncircumcised Greek convert. He's a believer in Christ. He's saved. While Paul and Titus are with this influential leadership team here in Jerusalem, they do not require that Titus be immediately circumcised because there is no need to be in order to be saved. But there is enormous pressure on Titus to be circumcised on the spot by these Judaizers, by these spies. Paul said he and the influential others did not yield, listen, strong language, did not yield for one moment to the pressure from inside the church in order to preserve the gospel as it was. There are Galatians, there you have it, that the Galatians now can know that they have the true gospel with nothing added. We return to our text, verse 6. 
And from those who, and from those who seemed influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. Now let me talk to you about Paul's argument there. Paul's strong part, point here is not to put down his colleagues and elevate himself. It's not to put down these influential leaders there in Jerusalem. His point here is that the top leadership here in the Jerusalem church, most likely Peter and James and John, James becomes the leader of the church, Peter is the leader of the apostles at this point per se, and maybe other influential leaders, it might have included all the 12, we don't know, listen, did not add anything to the gospel that Paul was preach, preaching. In other words, it was the same gospel of salvation that Paul was preaching that they were preaching in Jerusalem with nothing added. Paul continues in the text. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel... To the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me in mind to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, received the grace that was given, to, or perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. I remember one of the things that Jewish uh, religious leadership pushed was not sitting with the poor. Not having meals with the poor, not remembering the poor. They were beneath them. That's what uh, Peter and John and James have asked. Now, why is Paul writing about all of these details in his dealings in Jerusalem to the churches that he planted there in Galatia? Why is he doing that? Well, I believe he's doing that because there's a bigger picture at stake here other than Paul's authority and the distortion of the gospel message, although they're big enough, undermining the authority of the leaders in the church and the discourse, distortion of the gospel message. The bigger picture is whether there are two different gospels or just one gospel. That's the bigger picture. If the Judaizers that have come to the Galatian churches are saying that they, they have the correct gospel which they brought from Jerusalem with the blessings of the Jerusalem church and it includes circumcision and keeping the feasts and other traditions of, the Jude, of Judaism and Paul's gospel does not, then there are two gospels. And folks, here's what I would tell you this morning. That cannot be ever. There is not two gospels. These two gospels would be a contradiction with one another, and that would mean that the apostles would be a contradiction to one another. No such thing in Scripture. Paul is writing to clear up this bigger picture problem. Clearly, Paul makes the point that he presented his gospel in a private meeting with the leadership of the Jerusalem church, Peter, James, and John names them, and maybe others, and they added nothing to his gospel. Not only did they not add anything to the gospel message that Paul delivered to them, but when they realized Paul was taking the gospel message to the uncircumcised Gentiles, who, by the way, as Jews, they would never have relationship with, just as Peter was taking the gospel message to the circumcised Jews, and it was having the same success, they offered Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. You're on the team. Paul had achieved the intended outcome of his visit. He wanted to be able to completely discredit the Judaizers for false teacher, as false teachers who distorted the gospel, and he wanted to make sure that his labor amongst the Gentiles was not in vain. I want to take a moment here just to tell you something. I think we need to be very careful with the preachers and the teachers that we put forth in our culture today that we run so quickly to. I'm not jealous of them. I'm not jealous of the size of their church. One thing I am concerned about is their doctrine and what they preach. You'd be astonished if I named a few of them amongst you this morning. You might be listening to them. I've seen some of the quotes on Facebook. Some of them are heretics. 
some of what they're preaching is not truth. They're preaching a different gospel. I think we need to be very careful who we follow and what they say. Just a side note. Now I really will have time trouble finding out where I was in my notes. Paul had achieved his intended outcome of his visit. He wanted to be able to completely discredit the Jewsiders as false teachers that distorted the gospel. And he wanted to make sure that his labor amongst the Gentiles was not in vain. Folks, I, want to, I just said that because I want to make sure my labor amongst you is not in vain. In other words, he wanted to justify their faith and the inclusion in the body of Christ as they came to faith in the gospel that Paul was preaching. Ultimately, the gospel that Paul was preaching was the exact same gospel that Peter was preaching, and the results were that Jew and Gentile together were believed to be saved and reconciled to God and a member of God's family. Amen? As always, we then have to ask this question. Why do we have this text in the Bible? We have to apply it. What benefit is it here for us? Now, before we answer that question, I want to finish our passage today because I wasn't going to include this and then it fell right into what we were doing because this is why I, part of the reason why I think we have to be careful. We pick up our text in verse 11 and then I'm going to come and answer the question. But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, Paul says, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. This is the leader of the Jerusalem church. I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, that's coming from the Jerusalem church, read that, the representatives coming from the Jerusalem church, and they're visiting, they're doing a, a visit into the churches that Paul's planted, and in this particular case, they're doing a visit to the Antioch church. Before they came, Peter was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so then even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw their conduct, was not in step with the truth of the gospel. I said to Cephas, Peter, by the way, I think Paul's using his Hebrew name for a reason. He's not calling him by his new name. He's calling him by his Hebrew name because he's acting like a Hebrew. And that in itself is Paul opposing Peter to his face. I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? You get what's taking place here in this scene, right? Jewish believers from the Jerusalem church have come to visit the Gentile church in Antioch, if I can say it that way. Peter has been sitting with the Gentiles eating dinner, but when the representatives of this Jewish group show up, Peter stopped sitting with the Gentiles so he will be not accused like Jesus was of eating with sinners. What has Cephas done? What has Peter done? He has done the very thing the Judaizers were doing by their own demonstration. He has added something to the gospel. Just as Paul said, it wasn't the truth of the gospel. He has added something to gospel by refusing to sit with Gentiles because of Jewish tradition, teaching, and practice. In so doing... Because of Peter's leadership status, he affects the choice of Barnabas to do the same. In other words, his actions influence Barnabas to do the same and follow astray old Jewish traditions and practices. Peter is doing the very opposite of what he affirmed at the Jerusalem council. He's going back on his word. By his actions, he is demonstrating exactly what Judaizers wanted him to do. Adding works to the gospel message, and Barnabas is caught up in Peter's wake. By the way, folks, we can do the same thing. We can want people to jump through a whole bunch of hoops that we think is church stuff. And act a whole bunch of ways 
and add a whole bunch of things to the gospel message and have them jump through all of these hoops before we receive them into fellowship. That's what, Barnabas, that's what Paul was doing. And he's affected one of the leaders in the church, Barnabas. Paul is angry, by the way. There is a biblical anger that's okay. Jesus demonstrated it. If the master demonstrated it, it's okay. Paul is angry and he opposes Peter to his face before all those who are present. That's how upset he is. There's a whole message I just want to let you know on works righteousness and justification by faith. I am not going to talk to you about that today because I'm not stealing Jared's thunder. He's doing a great job with you preaching Romans and he's going to preach that text for you in two weeks. The reason I have included this portion of the text for today's message is to answer these questions that I just posed to you. Why do we have this text in the Bible? What benefit is it to us? The first benefit in having this text is to confirm, folks, that there is no other gospel. We have the one and only gospel as, affir- as confirmed by Paul and the other apostles in Jerusalem. They've all given their testimony to it and their endorsement of it. Jesus is the only gospel. Faith alone in Christ alone. The only good news with nothing else added and nothing else subtracted. Have you put your faith in the only gospel this morning? Faith alone in Christ alone is what brings our salvation because God accepted Jesus' sinless life and his death as the just payment and the just penalty for your sins and mine. Not his sin. He never sinned. He accepted it for your sin and mine. Have you put your faith in the only gospel? Have you confessed your sins and believed in Jesus Christ so that you are saved? If not, you can do that today, right here, right now. There is no other way back to God in order to have eternal life with him. That's the first benefit of what happened at the Jerusalem Council. And the only way you'll spend eternity with God is to confess your sins, believe in your heart, That Jesus died for your sins on the cross, went to the grave, and three days later overcame death, and now sits at the right hand of God, interceding on your behalf. Your sin, if you haven't confessed it, still condemns you to an eternal life separated from God, unless you've come to believe the only gospel The second benefit that we have from this text is that we have a great example in Paul with regards to confronting and handling disagreement, conflict, and or problems with one another. I do not know too many people, as I mentioned, who like disagreement, conflict, and or problems. Most most people actually have a tendency, because we're fallen, most people have a tendency to create conflict and problem and then run away from disagreement, conflict, and the problems. In fact, we practice that really well. We're good at it. I do not believe that we have an option of running away from conflict, disagreement, or problems, especially in the church. We ought to be different, especially in the church. I think that the scriptures coach and demonstrate something completely different than avoiding and or running away from problems. In our text for today, Paul confronts the Judaizers in Galatia and he confronts the Judaizers in Jerusalem directly along with with confronting Peter about his personal hypocrisy to his face. Now, by the way, we got to do that in love. And obviously Paul did it in love with Peter. In today's vernacular, Paul got in Peter's grill. That's what they call that. (laughs) Paul got in his face. There's a bigger picture here that we sometimes miss. The reason we should handle disagreements and conflict and problems and confrontation is the witness of the church. There's a bigger picture, folks. It goes beyond your individual pettiness. If I can say it that way. Oh, he's strong this morning, isn't he? 
It goes beyond that. There's a reason. There's a bigger picture, and it's the witness of the church. We have a higher calling as believers because, listen, we are the bride of Christ. Part of our higher calling is not only the witness of the church in the community, but also not to put a stumbling block before the brethren because we have mishandled ourselves like Cephas, like Peter had done, and affected Barnabas. Ignoring, sweeping things under the rug, and or running away from difficulties, conflict, and or problems without solving them are not options if we're going to stand firm for the truth and be the bride of Christ as the world watches intently. Trust me, they're watching our walk in Christ. Our loved ones, who might not believers be believers, are watching our walk with Christ. Avoiding confrontation because we're not comfortable isn't really an option with the bigger picture of the witness of the bride of Christ in the world. In Romans, Paul wrote, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never, listen, never be wise in your own sight. Repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. They're watching. And if possible, so far as it listen, instructions to you on this issue of handling difficulties between us, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. These three verses speak of speak individually to us, but reflect corporately the church's witness. Jesus, in Matthew 18, I'm not going to read you that whole passage in Matthew 18, starts out the passage, if your brother is in sin, go to him. And then, if he doesn't change, take two or more. You go read the passage. There's a purpose for us to get right with our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Paul, in coaching Timothy about this matter of confrontation and conflict inside the body, he said, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his, uh, and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, and then listen, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching, love, for the growth of the disciple who you're helping. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine and having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions inside the church. That's what he's talking about. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, be sober-minded. That's not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. It's meaning being humble always, especially when handling conflict. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your calling. By the way, we're all called to the mission. Fulfill your calling. Paul is saying to Timothy, reprove, rebuke, and exhort in love with great patience, helping your brother along in the midst of the conflict. Listen, Jesus promised difficulties in this life when he said this in John chapter 16 and verse 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. You're going to have conflict. But take heart, I have overcome the world. You're familiar with this scripture that I've been wrestling now. Actually, I'm now thinking I'm running up on a decade of wrestling with this passage of scripture. Count it all joy, my brethren. When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, discipleship, growth, maturity. And steadfastness has its full effect, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Listen, in wrestling with this passage for several years now, I'm beginning to love and embrace this passage like I believe James came to love and embrace it. You think that's weird, embracing trials. But listen, the picture I now have of James from this passage is that, excuse me, James has grown in such maturity that he's come to a place where he is running to trials. He's running to conflicts and or challenges, especially in the body of Christ, with joy, not grumbling or complaining, but with joy, because when, 
when that happens, when they are handled biblically, those trials and, and, and testing, when they're handled biblically, it makes you, makes him and others perfect and complete disciples, lacking in nothing with regards to your transformation or my transformation, us conforming or being conformed into the image of Christ, how we were originally created to be before the fall. That's what he's talking about related to how we handle trials and temptations inside the body of church or uh, Christ and outside. Side. Your proper biblical handling of trials manifests it, manifest itself in spiritual maturity, and that brings overwhelming joy, resulting in being all the more welcoming to conflict opportunities so that you can be perfected more and more and become a faithful, true witness, and the bride of Christ is illuminated to all those around you. I'll take a breath for a moment. I need it. How about you? Do you joyfully welcome trials and conflict? There might be a negative side to that question. That might be, do you joyfully create trials and conflicts? You might need to wrestle with that. Do you run with joy to trials and conflict? Even more importantly, do you run with joy to trials and conflict in the church? Would you agree with me that we don't do conflict well? I think we need to get much better at that, personally and corporately. The third benefit in having this text is that we should desire to stand firm on sound doctrine because the world wants to redefine Scripture from mankind's perspective. It's relentless. The enemy is relentless about twisting the Word of God to modify the truth of Scripture. In fact, listen to this. Several years ago, I think I've told this story before. I'm going to tell it again because it bears repeating. Several years ago, now I was headed to a concert, a Christian concert down in the Binghamton Arena. And just outside the arena was a large church. I'm not going to tell you what denomination it was, but it was a large mainline denomination church. And hanging in a huge banner, rainbow color, huge banner, was written these words, God's theology is evolving. No, it's not. Exclamation point. Yes, God loves the sinner, but his theology is not changing. It's a completely false statement coming from the church. The church has endorsed it. If God can change the rules, then I want to tell you folks, we're all in trouble. He's not God anymore if he changes the rules. Amen? Listen to these scriptures that back up that position. Malachi 3, 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. That's the point I just made. If God was changeable and could morph his theology, we would be consumed because we're shooting for the wrong goalposts. And if God can move the goalposts, we're in trouble. The writer of Hebrews said this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led astray or away, away by diverse and strange teachings. That's the first half of verse 8 in Hebrews 13. Folks, doctrine is important. What we believe unchanged by the world is important as it is the only gospel that leads people from death to life back to God. We have the truth, and the truth does not change no matter what pressure it receives from the world, whether from inside the church or from outside the church. We cannot pick and choose which portion of God's Word that we'll believe in and which portions we won't and which ones we won't apply to our lives and which ones we will. By the way, that's called idolatry. And I think God addressed that in the opening uh, commandment, thou shall have no other gods before me. So when we pick and choose which part of Scripture we'll listen to and which part we won't, we've created God in our own image. And that's a huge no-no. This is why I continue 
to encourage you to be good students of the word always, day in and day out, so that you know the truth and can stand, by the way, so you know the truth and it sets you free, and you can stand firm when confronted with that which is not truth, especially when it's the world's doctrine knocking at the door. By the way, when you study it and know it that well, it gives you confidence when it comes to offering witness and hope to all those who are around you, by, as I mentioned, that are intently watching your witness regarding what you believe. I'll con- close with these thoughts in question form. How good are you, are you at standing firm when confronted with unsound doctrine from both inside the church and outside the church. Remember Paul said, savage wolves will rise up amongst you. How good you are standing firm when confronted with sound, unsound doctrine for both in, from both inside the church and outside. Have you become a believer who can properly handle the word of God? Are you getting the gospel right in order to share it with those around you by word and deed? The demonstration of the gospel. Remember I said, it's more caught than taught. And your demonstration is a greater witness than your word. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word this morning. Oh, God, I pray that it would find its place in our heart. From our own internal struggle to walk deeply with you, God. And the external witness to those around us who, God, are watching intently our walk. May God, you be glorified in the demonstration of what we believe into the world around us that's dying and going to hell without, without Jesus. We ask in his name, amen. So I'm giving you a home assignment. I, I'm, I'm sending you home with an assignment this morning. Um, and and uh, this is the assignment. If I were a non-believer and expressed interest in what you believe, could you at this very moment, could you at this very moment share your faith and why you believe with me? Could you sit down and open up the Word of God with me and show me why you believe? That's your challenge. Because... To be honest with you, we got to be able to share the truth of the Word of God with those around us. But then I'll give you another challenge, and this is another assignment as you go because you're headed to your mission field. We can't just hang out with one another. We can't just hang out with one another. We have to hang out with a sinner so that they invite that question. And then... We can walk by the works that God created. We can walk in the works that God created for us to do individually and corporately before the foundation of the world. God bless you as you go to your mission field this morning. Peace.